Well, welcome all. Nice to see your names in the chat. Um, before we uh, get going formally, I wanted to check in with you about how things are going, but also maybe if you have any interesting or weird food stories to share. Um, give you an example. This isn't ex exactly weird, but so much has changed because of the way we're living and the way we're eating and shopping or not shopping. So much has changed in the last couple of weeks. And once again, it, it provides some interesting insights about how um, how we are with our food, like how we either do or don't buy food frequently. I used to buy food, you know, every couple of days I would go and buy something and kept very little food in my house. And suddenly my fridge is incredibly full of food. And I looked at my budget and I'd spent like, last month anyway, I spent like $300 more on food than usual. That's not because I'm eating more, it's because I'm storing more in my house, just because I'm going shopping a lot less frequently and I want to make sure I had, you know, beans and tuna fish, and whatever else. So my house has now become like a little warehouse full of food. Uh, but th that surprised me. But I also noticed it in my fridge. My fridge is really full right now. Usually I don't keep my fridge that full um, because you know, mostly it's condiments and some um, fresh vegetables and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot of weird like comfort food is missing from the grocery stores and uh, at least the toilet paper is back. Flour was gone for a while. Now it's back. But there are weird, strange behaviors. Anyway, so I got... I started thinking, now that I've got so much food in my fridge, welcome back, ma'am. Um, now that I've got so much food in my fridge, it's it's like I'm losing things because I things get shoved to the back of the fridge and I want to make sure I'm not wasting anything. So I went investigating a couple of days ago and I found my old sourdough starter for my bread, which I used to use a lot, but I don't make bread that much anymore. Um, and I thought, ooh, it's been it's been a while, and you're supposed to keep those things alive by feeding them often. So I didn't know whether it was still good or not. So I pulled out I have two jars of it in case one of them gets infected with a, a mold or something like that. And um, and I put them in bowls with a bit of extra fresh water and some flour. And yay, it's still alive. There's my sourdough starter. And so I've been feeding it for a couple of weeks. No, not a couple of weeks. <laughs> It feels like a couple of weeks. I've been feeding it for uh, two or three days, and it's smelling good. And uh, there are two versions of it. One, I thought I would try pastry flour in it to see whether, because pastry flour has less protein and more available starch and it's finer particles of flour, I thought maybe that'll be easier for the yeast to eat again. And then I looked at the bag and I was like, oh no, this pastry flour has been treated with chlorine to bleach it. But that chlorine is actually one of the ingredients on the bag. And I was like, ugh, that's disgusting. So I thought I killed my sourdough by adding flour with chlorine to it. Turns out it did just fine. It's a very mighty yeast. And the other one's doing well as well. So I've got two batches and I'm going to put them back in the fridge. I'm going to make some bread this afternoon. Anyway, so that's my like little example of how. The fact that I had more food in my fridge made me look at the back of my fridge, made me find my sourdough starter, made me restart my sourdough starter, making me make bread again. So thanks to the pandemic, and there's a lot of funny things that are going on. People are behaving differently. I mean, the things we're buying in the stores are different, but also, you know, people are relearning how to cook at home sometimes. And sometimes we're now having cocktail parties on Zoom, and sometimes we're buying more food than usual or making preserves. I made some marmalade a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, things are changing. And sometimes there are some positive outcomes. And so that's what I wanted to think about today. And there'll be a little assignment at the end of the class to focus on that as well. But for now, anyway, anyone else have an example of something interesting or fun or weird or surprising or good that has come out of the last couple of weeks of your different food lives. And when having examples, you can turn on your mic and say it out loud or just type it in the chat. But I'd like to find something positive in the midst of all of this confusion and fear. So over to you. Examples, please. Yeah, yeah, I'm really focused on wasting less too. It's like, oh, look. A piece of bread. Oh, I'm cooking less too. Okay. Oh yeah, good. So 
making your own yeast. Yeah, it's because it's not there's yeast everywhere in the atmosphere. So if you create the right environment for it, uh, it can grow. Growing seeds, what kind of seeds, David? Excellent. So you're going twice a week. Okay, I'm down to once a week. David, are you growing those seeds inside or do you have an outdoor garden space that you can go to? Right, so you're just, you're just starting the seedlings and then we'll transplant them when the weather is warm enough. Cool. Oh, really? Get, having troubles getting the yeast because the yeast producers themselves are, have slowed down as well? Nice. Yeah, my marmalade was Meyer lemon. I on a sort of ridiculous whim, I bought a bag of Meyer lemons at the grocery store. I thought I'm not going to use these for anything, so I had to turn them into marmalade. But it's the first time I made marmalade, and it turned out pretty well. Yeah. Oh, okay. So people are buying the yeast, but but this is this is for brewing yeast, right? Not. Uh, Oh, so people are brewing at home, maybe? Is that what the problem is? Or the issue? Oh, you can use any yeast. Okay. I thought there's a special kind of yeast for things like cider and beer. I suppose any, any kind of yeast will produce some kind of alcohol at some point. Yeah. Well, there are different varietals of yeast, too, for different kinds of effects and stuff. So I wonder if home brewing has gone up. It would not be surprising. Home everything is going up. Anyway, we'll come back to this um, at the end of the class. So to that will be there will be a little assignment. It's actually a an illustration or a drawing. Um, so it's not going to be so uh, word oriented. So I'll, I'll tell you about that at the end of the class, and I'll put a posting on on um, on the announcements, and then that'll be due by the end of the day today. There's no time limit on it, but basically end of day today, whenever you your day ends um, before that. And then there will also be a pre-class assignment for next week. And so the, the the little quiz you did last week, plus this illustration from this week, plus the pre-class assignment for next week, that'll that'll be the equivalent of the 15% that would have been given to the pledge assignment. So <clears throat> those will be the three little assignments, little exercises. Um, and probably a lot faster to do than the pledge and, and probably uh, more worth easier to get better points. So um, today we are going to uh, combine again two classes. So we've got uh, week five and week six in both of this class. Uh, checklist assignment is still due, yeah, and it's due next week. And so I'll go through that again briefly today. Uh, I've got some more notes on that. But then if you have any extra questions about it, I will hang around in the, uh, the other classroom space after this class so we can just ask more questions about it. But yeah, so the assignment's still due. Really important, and I will remind you again about this, to, to look at the instructions for the assignment. You have to actually pay attention to everything that the assignment description says so you can follow along correctly. Uh, but so we've got two classes. We've got food systems and then ethics. And it's important to get the ethics work done today because ethics is a part of sustainability. And so for the checklist assignment, what we talk about today might be very useful. And I'll point you to some other resources as well for the checklist assignment. And what else we got? Oh yeah, and then for next week, so instead of having ethics be next week, we're gonna do an exam review next week. And that's what the pre-class assignment will be about too, so I'll explain that later. And, uh, and then week seven is just gonna be the exam. So next week is exam review and a few good news stories. So I've got some examples of positive sustainable food systems to share. And then um, we'll do the exam review and then we will, uh, then the final week is just going to be the exam. So you'll do that in class. It will be short answers and some multiple choice questions. And um, it should be pretty straightforward. And it'll only be only take about an hour to do the maximum, I think. Um, anyone who's got accommodations for extra time will be able to take them. But by and large, it shouldn't take more than an average. Uh, it shouldn't take much more than about an hour. And uh, I think that's it. All right. So let's dive into... First of all, the <clears throat> checklist assignment. So I just wanted to walk through these steps again so it's, it's really clear to everybody. 
the this is all outlined also in the PDF of the checklist assignment that's on Blackboard, but just to, to walk through slowly and, and clearly. And I did this with you all last week, but I just want to do it one more time a bit more just to make sure everyone is hearing the same thing. Um, so basically, first of all, you are the idea is that you are building a tool that you can use to evaluate how sustainable different food categories are for an actual food business that you might like to run one day. So the very first step is to pick that food business. So you're actually coming up with something that you might be interested in doing, whether that's a restaurant or a catering company or a butcher shop or a food truck. And um, that makes it one, real, so that you can imagine what the real parameters are. And two, hopefully it's something that you actually might like to do um, so that it can you can be a bit more invested in this assignment. Uh, the second part after you've got that food business is identify what the categories, the different categories of food products and only food products, okay, not, not equipment, not uh, labor practices, nothing else about the, the kitchen or the, just the food products. You identify the categories of food products that you would need for that business. So again, I told you about last week or whenever it was, <laughs> somewhere back in the past, we talked about the idea of a taco truck. So the food products for a taco truck might be things that the categories anyway would be tortillas, meat, condiments, beverages, vegetables, let's say. So you might have five categories. Uh, you might have others as well. But we're not talking about paying, we're not talking about uh, electricity, any of those things, just the food products. And you're not actually identifying all the foods, but the categories, the basic categories. So the categories will be different depending on what business you choose. If you choose a butcher shop, pretty well all your categories are gonna be meat items. So then you'd be breaking it down more finely than just meat for a taco truck. You might say for a butcher shop, uh, poultry, beef, lamb, whatever else, game, anything else that you would might think about selling through from that butcher shop. So depending on the business, you'll pick different categories. And then once you've identified those categories, you're gonna start figuring out what kind of criteria or standards you can use to measure the sustainability of those different categories. Now we've done, you know, all these classes are about different ways that food is produced in ways that are sustainable and not sustainable or less sustainable. So the criteria are gonna be measuring devices. Now, there are lots of different kinds of sustainability, so there are lots of different kinds of criteria. You might talk about environmental criteria and social, sorry, environmental sustainability criteria, social sustainability criteria, cultural sustainability, economic sustainability. All of those different kinds of sustainability will allow you to come up with different criteria. For the whole checklist, you need to have 40 different criteria in total, and they have to be different. So if you've got, say, five categories, and the five categories are meat, vegetables, condiments, beverages, uh, tortillas, you can't have local be the same criteria across all five categories. You can only use local once. You can only use organic once. You can only use grain-fed once. You can only use whatever. So each of the criteria and your whole checklist has to be different from all the other criteria. That means, <clears throat> excuse me, once you've got your categories of food products, you'll know about how many criteria you need to have for each category. So if you got to have 40 criteria by the end and you picked five categories, that means there are about eight criteria per category because eight times five is 40. You can also have no, four, four criteria for category A and 12 criteria for category B. Depends on what the, what the category is. For tortillas, there may be fewer sustainability criteria than there is for meat, for example. Uh, but that's going to be up to you. In any case, in total, minimum 40 different criteria and different criteria. Okay. Now, you can you, your criteria can be based on different, or you can... You can determine how you measure those criteria. Um, you can just have a simple yes, no system. So is it organic? Is it not organic? Yes, no. But you could also do it in a way that was more like on a scale. So it might be points based. So you might say, um, you know, to do with if you're talking about localness, if you want to buy local tortillas, 
then you might say, okay, if they're produced within the neighborhood of my taco truck, that'll worth, be worth 10 points. If they're produced within Toronto, that'll be worth five points. If they're produced in Ontario, it's worth two points. And if they're produced outside of Canada, zero points. So you could do some sort of scale-based thing and then make your evaluation process be more mathematical because you just add up points. Some, someone did a similar version to that, which was color-coded. It's basically the colors of a stoplight, so green, yellow, and red, with green being, hey, that's great, sustainable, red being not sustainable, yellow being somewhat sustainable. And so then they were able to have some kind of wiggle room in there. So you might evaluate, you know, this tortilla is really sustainable in terms of its location and its environmental impact, but not so sustainable in terms of its culture and really not sustainable in terms of its price. So you've got different ways to measure. Them. So this is all up to you. Um, I'm not giving you examples because part of this assignment is to have you think about how you would assign not only criteria, but how you're gonna then use different measuring systems to use those criteria for your evaluation. So that's sort of the checklist. Um, 40 elements to that checklist, which are the criteria or standards broken down by categories that are appropriate to your food business. Once you've done that, then you go on and you go through all the steps that are actually outlined in the assignment description. And so just uh, to look at that again, Briefly, here's that. So just as, yeah, as a reminder, it is due next week before the start of class. So by one o'clock on April 9th. Then here is, uh, okay, here is what I just described. Pick your food business, identify the categories, pick the criteria determine how you're gonna be measuring those criteria. And then for the actual assignment, what you need to do for the write-up is all listed here in <clears throat> items one, two, three, and on the next page, four. So do read this, read this a couple of times to make sure you understand it, and then go through all these different steps. So first of all, you're going to, in the introduction, which is pretty short, maybe 100 words, it's really not a long section, don't spend so much time on it, because it's worth, as you can see, 10%. So first of all, describe sustainability in your own words. And I really want you to use your own words because I don't want to just see some quote from Wikipedia or something from the slides that we've already presented. I want to hear from you how sustainability should be understood. Then you can, I mean, you can do this in whatever order you want, but then I would say name your business. Tell me, okay, I'm going to do a taco truck. It's going to be in downtown Toronto. And then write a mission statement. And last week we looked at a bunch of different businesses, or I showed you the links to a bunch of different businesses' uh, mission statements. So there's some examples there. Remember, mission statements should be clear and compelling and not use jargon and actually say something um, so that they become meaningful to you, your customers, your staff, your boss, whoever else. So you've got your business and your mission statement. And then describe your checklist. So again, you're not, this is not showing your checklist, but describing it. What's the structure? What's the design? How and why did you make it that way? Why did you use just yes, no answers? Or why did you use a sliding scale from one to 10? Or what have you done to, to create this checklist and why? So that's all in the first bit in the introduction. Then you actually show your checklist. So you can use that. You can show it in a table form or some grid form. It can just be a list of words. But basically, you want to show it in such a way that I can understand what are your categories? What are your criteria? Um, and that's that's the major chunk of this assignment. It's worth 40% of the overall grade for this particular assignment. And um, what else? And that's it. Then third step is justify the criteria in your checklist. So for each of those criteria, I want to know why they are questions to ask about sustainability. So if you say, for example, I'm only gonna serve grass-fed beef, or grass, is, is the beef grass-fed or not? That's my criterion. Why is grass-fed beef more sustainable than non-grass-fed beef? And so you explain, okay, well, grass-fed beef produces, the cows produce less methane, uh, grass is better for their digestive systems because that's what they were 
crops. That's what they are biologically supposed to eat. Um, eating grass versus corn produces less E. coli, and that's good for human health. Um, so all these reasons. Um, and so you can basically just write a short phrase or even one sentence for each of the criteria as your justification. So that could also be in your grid. So if you have, say, right, here's, here's my category one criteria, one, two, three, four, five, and then justification one, two, three, four, five, right adjacent to the criteria so that I can see exactly how it is. Okay, um, so India, if you have any questions about anything I just said, or if any of you are having problems with, with your connections, um, this is all being recorded as well. So I'll be posting the recording back up on Blackboard later on so you can catch up on anything. And you can also ask me questions um, at the end of the class. So you've got criteria, justifications, or you can just show me your criteria in a list and then underneath the justifications, but make it clear which justification is attached to which criterion. So that's the third section. And then the fourth section is putting your uh, checklist to use. And there you're gonna choose two similar food products that are relevant to your business from one of the categories that you've picked. So for example, with the, with the taco truck, you might pick two different kinds of tortillas. One's made in Mexico from genetically modified corn. One's made in Toronto from uh, heritage breed corn. Uh, the one in Mexico is made by Mexican people, and the one in Toronto is made by people who are, don't have any Mexican heritage. And then you just use your checklist to evaluate how those two products are more or less sustainable, and then ultimately which one you would choose for your restaurant and why. So that, that part's also important because it's really putting your checklist uh, into action and making it meaningful. So if you, if you two, pick two products and you can't figure out which one's more sustainable by your checklist, you might want to modify your checklist. Um, be careful to pick really, I'm going to underline this again, two similar food products. Um, in past, people have picked like grass-fed beef and organic tomatoes, and those are not similar food products, so you can't actually compare them using your checklist. So you need to pick two that are comparable uh, and also that you can use your checklist to evaluate. And there are some examples here uh, about, uh, you know, beef and tomatoes and things like this. You can't use those examples because those are my examples. Um, but anyway, they're just to give you some ideas. Okay, third page of this uh, document or this PDF is useful to look at. Uh, it's a, basically a self-check. So after you finish your assignment, go and ask yourself all these questions and it'll help make sure that you've done everything in the assignment, you've asked yourself all the relevant questions, and so if you're missing something, you can go back and fix up your assignment. I think that is it. Don't forget, actually, major important bit. Use citations and references, please. Do not plagiarize. Do not make accidental plagiarism mistakes. Anytime you're taking ideas or words or facts from another source, you have to cite them and, and put a reference at the end of your assignment. Any questions on the assignment? I know I've gone over this a couple of times, and I don't want to bore you to tears, but I want to make sure there's nothing confusing. So if you have any questions, now's the time or later. Nobody understand why you couldn't use a criteria or organic. Yeah, no, it's irrelevant. So I'm just going to go back to this question that David, you can all read the question. Um, you can't use a criterion more than once. It is important, obviously, for many different categories. So organic is an important uh, criterion for sustainability for many different categories of food. But the point of the assignment is to demonstrate that you can come up with 40 different criteria. So yes, it's supposed to be a useful checklist. But the other thing is it's supposed to be a demonstration of your ability to think across different kinds of sustainability and come up with a bunch of different examples. Because um, it would be very easy just to say organic, local, no GMO, Da, 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 and have you know the same five criteria for each of the different categories, and that's not actually showing a great understanding of the breadth of, of sustainability. So do think about all the different kinds of sustainability, environmental, social, cultural, economic, political. Think about people, planet, profit, uh, policy. Today we'll talk about ethics, so the ethical treatment of animals, talk about transparency, talk about a bunch of different things. Um, 
Um, these are all of the different sources that you can look to for uh, finding sustainability criteria. And of course, that's, that's the point of this assignment is to demonstrate the breadth of understanding. Any other questions? Okay. Onward. So, going back to slides. So there's the checklist assignment. Um, now, in the next, so these slides are not quite in the same order on Blackboard, but they are all there. Um, these are actually also from last week's PowerPoint presentation. Um, and these are just some examples, some resources for you that you can look to for making up the checklist. And these are examples of different businesses and organizations that promote sustainability, largely in food, but in also tourism and other places. So we've got uh, Wasted. This is a London, Ontario-based uh, food waste organization that measures different levels of sustainability based on waste, but the Feast on Ontario and Leaders in Environmentally Accountable Food Service, these are programs that uh, food businesses can use to evaluate their own sustainability and also um, learn how to become more sustainable. Relay is a restaurant in um, Park that has been voted the most sustainable restaurant in the world a couple of times in the, in the past decade. There's also the Sustainable Restaurant Association, the University of Guelph Sustainable Restaurant Group, the Vancouver Island Green Business Certification. So these are all different organizations that help businesses figure out how to be more sustainable. And on their websites, <clears throat> you'll see a lot of different criteria that these organizations use to evaluate sustainability. So this is a really good set of resources for, um, for this assignment. And of course, throughout all PowerPoint slides, there are lots and lots of different resources that you can use to identify different ways that food can be more sustainable. All right, enough with the checklist assignment. <clears throat> so we went through this last week, um, and as we actually gave the big reveal last week, which was that one of you out of 10 chose the 6% bonus points, one of you chose zero, and eight of you chose 2%, uh, which is a very different result, as you'll see from the culinary diploma program, uh, who I taught this morning. So you guys, only one of you, which was 10% of the class, chose 6%, but that person got knocked out by the person who chose 0%. So unfortunately, Mr. Zero, or Ms. Zero, knocked out Mr. or Ms. Six, meaning that the eight of you who chose 2% are getting 2% bonus points. However, in the earlier class, <laughs> maybe this speaks to a larger group size or maybe it's just a different attitude, I don't know. But in that group, uh, six people chose 6%. One of them got knocked out by the person who chose 0%, leaving five. It was a group of 30 people. Oh no, it wasn't even that, because there were only 20 people in the class that day. Um, so two two of them would have been a max, it would have been the 10% where we went over and tipped into zero. Five of them selfishly chose 6%, which meant that nobody got bonus points from the other class. Um, and they were all laughing about that. But it's interesting how sometimes a smaller group um, behaves in the more sustainable way than a larger group. And that's often because there's a sense of responsibility to each other. But it's a kind of neat exercise for thinking about, really about this idea of taking a fair share and not taking more. Um, and yet there will always be someone who, almost always someone, who takes more than their share. Um, and in the world of food systems, those are you know, large corporations or wealthy landowners or countries even that exploit other countries in the old colonial system. Um, colonialism was all about exploiting a smaller place, taking more than uh, that country deserved by going off and using someone else's land and someone else's labor. So this is a, a simple little exercise to do in class, but then it also illustrates a lot about how, how humans are and how, not capitalism, but capitalism out of control or capitalism that is based on greed or exploitation can produce a lot of really negative issues for the rest of the world. 
So that's how that scored. And you can all, some of you can look forward to your 2% extra points. <coughs> Just a few things to remember from the profit class last week. The concept of profit in the first place, which is uh, straightforward, most of us understand it. <clears throat> that is total sales, basically, all the money you bring in minus all of your expenses. And what's left over is the profit. Concept of profit, though, builds into it the possibility of profit over the long term. And this is where we get to the idea of sustainable profit. Because some business models say, make as much money as you can right away. And that is a better business model. But built into that is sometimes the idea that you might be charging more in order to make that profit. You might be using cheaper quality base ingredients. You might be exploiting your labor force. You might be doing something that isn't so sustainable in order to maximize profit right away. And if you do that, your business might end up being not very sustainable in the long term, like it doesn't last. And so built into profit is also a question of time and how long you want that profit to continue being generated. And we had that, we saw that in that headline uh, from Fast Company, which said sustainable profit means profit forever, it doesn't mean no profit. So this, this, there's this tension that always exists between the idea of making a profit and being sustainable. And a lot of people think you can't be sustainable and make a profit. And that's, of course, not true. But it's, the, it's the, our sort of reaction, it's our, it's our knee jerk reaction to the idea of profit and sustainability. And it's partly because this whole idea of sustainability is relatively new. And it often seems like it means making a sacrifice for profit or making a sacrifice of some sort, which could limit your profit. <clears throat> but let's just think about it in different ways. And there are some examples that we'll get to later on about systems that are more closed loop and therefore waste less. And so it can be profitable and sustainable at the same time. Externalities, uh, we discussed a few times. Anybody have a memory of what an externality is or an example of an externality? Do I hear crickets chirping? No? There are some examples of externalities in the next bullet points. So externalities are anything in a system, a financial system or an environmental system, that is not accounted for in the final rendering. So anything that's left out of the accounting, whether that's financial accounting or conceptual accounting. And some of them are, are things like we, we call hidden costs. So hidden costs in, for example, the hamburger that we heard about from Raj Patel are things like the long-term healthcare costs of a population that's been eating too many hamburgers all their lives, or the carbon footprint of uh, that hamburger that's not actually accounted for in the $4 price, but that exists because we've been exploiting other lands, producing pollution, dealing uh, unfairly in terms of labor practices, underpaying workers, all sorts of things that create hidden costs that the consumer doesn't pay for, but that someone in that whole food production web uh, will have paid for by the end of the day. So that's where the externalities come in. Anything that's not accounted for in the final rendering <clears throat> of the system. So this all ties into, oh, sorry, making the slides jump around. Um, this all ties into what Raj Patel told us about in that video, which is, Within any given food item, he used the hamburger, there is always going to be a hidden cost because our, all of our food systems are set up in such a way as to transfer the cost of some of that production onto or into other places. So it's onto the backs of poorly paid workers or into the uh, waste products that are going out back out into our environment. The cost of the object, the price of the object is low, the cost is high. And that's, what, uh, that's why Raj Patel used this example. And then the final bit, this actually isn't really a, a, a profit question, but it's this issue about what policy is. And the idea that policy is only as good as its enforcement is really important when it comes to food sustainability, because we can create all sorts of policies that support sustainable production. 
if they're not enforced, if they're not policed and then enforced, the policy is just a piece of paper with some words on it. Um, so, you know, one of the obvious examples right now in the pandemic era is that lots of governments at the provincial and federal level in Canada, for example, have created policies to um, require that human beings socially isolate or to require that we don't assemble in large groups to require certain behaviors like quarantine after we come back from travel abroad. But those policies can be put in place, but without someone policing them and then enforcing them, people are, may not follow those policies. They may follow them because they, they want to, but if they don't want to, there's nothing really stopping them from breaking the rule. And so we're seeing that all over the place where people are assembling in large groups. And now some of the governments are starting to crack down. And here in Quebec, they've been issuing tickets and police have even arrested a couple of people for continuing to have large parties or groups of gatherings of people who are not their family members in their homes and, um, and breaking the policy. So now they start being enforced. So if you come back again to what is a policy, policy is a plan to deal with an issue. And then it's followed up by writing that plan down in words so that it's clear and understandable, and then communicating that plan to the people that it addresses. And then not just communicating it, but enforcing it, making sure that the people who are being communicated to actually pay attention and follow the rules in the policy. And then the last bit of it is sometimes the policy needs to be changed. So we need to then think, oh, okay, the context is different. So once the pandemic is over, some of these policies will need to be changed or just taken away altogether because the situation is no longer the same. The issue that the policy was written for doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so the policy has to get rid of it. But sometimes it's more subtle than that. So this idea that there's five steps in any policy is something to pay attention to as well, because it's not just communicate and force. It's actually come up with the plan, identify what the solution is for the issue that you're trying to solve, write it down, communicate it, enforce it, revise it. So those are the five <clears throat> major elements of policy. Yeah, and then India, you're saying, yeah, martial law, policies are, you know, some policies turn into laws. So a policy is a, is a plan that's communicated, but that can also equally become a law. And it's really important in some situations to institute very rigid policies so that other issue is, issues can be, uh, so that those issues that are serious can be resolved. Yeah, the five, the five elements of policy are coming up with a plan. Okay, so, you know, the policy is, or the issue is people are assembling in public and they're transferring a virus. So what's the plan? Come up with a plan, which is make sure people don't assemble or make sure that people stay apart or you know, make sure that something happens to stop that transfer of the virus. So the plan is step one. It's the idea that the policy is, is written about. The second part is writing the policy. And they're written down so that there is one agreed upon rule that deals with this issue. So that when it's written and formalized in that way, it's not like, oh yeah, we should stay distant from each other. Well, how distant? In what situation? Why? That's why you write it down. So all those details are very clear. You come up with a plan, you write it down. Then it has to be communicated. So it has to go get emailed out to people or it needs to be written down in a book of laws. It needs to be put into the court system. It needs to be sent out in the media. So the communication part is so that people who the, the policy affects actually know what the policy is. So you write it down, no, sorry, you come up with a plan, you write it down, you communicate it, and then people, the people who are affected need to follow it. That's, in, that's implicit. But the, the fifth, sorry, the fourth bit is enforcement. So you go out, make sure people are following the policy, and if not, enforce it by fining them, arresting them, re-communicating it. It doesn't have to be as, as serious as arrest or a fine but it needs to be enforced in some way, made applicable to the people's lives. And then after enforcement, revision, when and if necessary. And then that brings, and the revision, if you see my hand, comes all the way back to the plan, the writing, the communication. So it's, it's a loop also. Is that clearer? Great. All right, so that's the brief recap from last week. 
this week we're going to look at uh, a brief history of food systems and it's really not about food systems so much about the evolutions that have happened in food systems and in fact in the first week I covered a lot of these details but I'm going to summarize them very quickly so that we can see how with each evolution in a food system we solve some problems and then we create other problems and that's really that's really what happens in um, and this is also in, in policies. As you revise things, you may fix some things, but you also may create new issues that need to be fixed in the future. So we're going to look at some of that history briefly. Um, and then we're going to look at the idea of a closed loop food system and how that might support maybe some sustainability in the world of food. That's this chunk that's on food systems and then we're going to go into ethics after the break uh, and look at a couple of different kinds of ethics and yeah a few more things that's today so first i want to start with just a kind of i don't know a, a really positive i find positive and uplifting example of a food hero or a number of food heroes who have been addressing this issue of food waste. And as we talked about, there's a huge amount of food wasted within the food system. And so much food is wasted at some point in the food system that uh, there's actually enough food, there should be enough food for everybody on the planet. So waste is this giant issue. Maybe 30% of all of our food is wasted. And it's wasted everywhere. It's wasted by us, the consumer, it's wasted at the point of wholesale and resale in the store. It's wasted during transformation and processing. It's wasted during uh, transportation. And it's wasted at the site of production as well. Um, because, as you'll, as you'll see in the next videos, and as we know, we, the consumer, are way more likely to buy a pretty looking vegetable or fruit, a nice standard looking one, then we are to buy ones that are kind of deformed or weird. And that's just what we've been trained to do over time because we're presented with beautiful looking fruits and vegetables for the most part in grocery stores. And the more we get used to that, the less willing we are to buy ones that look a little bit funny or that have, are misshapen or that seem maybe to have a growth on them. So I'm gonna, we're gonna show a couple of those things, but just before, we get into that and see if we can make this polling system work. And the question for you all is, would you buy a weird looking fruit or vegetable instead of a perfect one? if they were the same price. Let's see, there you go. There's a poll for you to respond to. Please click your answer now. Okay, two more of you, two more of you. Click, click, click. One more, one to go. Who's gonna be the tiebreaker? This is so exciting. Oh no, they're undecided or asleep. <laughs> okay. Yes, it's more complicated than a yes or no. But if they're exactly the same price, so this is really interesting. I'm surprised. In the other class, there were like two people who said yes, and everybody else said, no, of course not. I buy the nice looking one. So for those of you who said yes, you would buy the weird looking one. Why? Sorry, can you please repeat your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why would, so the question was, the, the poll was, why would you buy a weird looking fruit or vegetable instead of uh, a nice looking one or a, a standard looking one if there's no difference in price yeah okay so it's interesting to try something different sure um maybe you have sympathy for the weird looking one because you feel like you look a little weird that's my reason um 
more artistic. Awesome. Okay, great. I mean, there's other things. Standard fruits and vegetables are sometimes easier to cut up because they don't have like weird little bits hanging off of them and maybe there's less waste and certainly restaurants tend to go for standardization more than that. But we also just have gotten used to it. Um, you know, if, we're, if you're a gardener or a farmer, you know that roughly 25 or 30 percent of your harvest is going to be a bit weird looking. So you're more familiar with it if you're closer to the way that the food is produced. But once you get to the grocery store where everything's supposed to be shiny and perfect, you know, we're just not as habituated to do that. So I just saw the last comment from Bailey. It was sold as an item and not weighed on the ugly one. Yeah, 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 for sure. And so the ugly vegetables don't feel lonely. Very nice. All right, so all sorts of good reasons to buy weird looking fruits and vegetables. I'm going to show you a, a video. Or you're going to look at a video, which I will send you the link to. Um, and this is a campaign by Intermarché, which is a big uh, supermarket chain in France uh, that decided to take this issue on. So it's in French. I'll explain what the French uh, says afterwards, but basically you'll you'll get the point, I think, from the video. The uh, video is two and a half minutes long. So I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, I will turn off my audio and video, and we will meet back and talk about this in two and a half minutes. So assuming that you have now watched that video or are most of the way through it. So they did this thing, they, they valorized it, right? They made a celebration out of weird looking fruits and vegetables. And so mush is this word in French, sort of slang for ugly or inglorious as it's been translated as. And they had this playful um, attitude 
they've obviously got really beautiful photography, so they've, they've made these strange looking fruits and vegetables glamorous. They've created a special section in the grocery store, special price. They reduced the price by 30%. They did all this promotion. Um, they made it kind of fun and interesting. They gave away uh, juice and soup made out of the carrots and the, and the oranges so that people could understand that there's certainly no difference in taste. And <clears throat> they just turned it into a, an event. <coughs> Excuse me. And it was also in support of not wasting food, which almost everybody can get behind. So they had a really good PR message and then they had some really good promotional elements. And of course, what they saw was, yeah, so the, the, there were no English subtitles, but what they saw was <clears throat> people were enthusiastic. Um, in uh, two days, they ran out of stock. Each store that was participating was sold an average of 1.2 tons of these fruits and vegetables in the first few days. Their profits went up. They got a ton of social media. They got a ton of commercial media. Um, so obviously they got, they benefited a lot. The whole store benefited a lot because they were getting all this positive PR. But they also introduced to the consumer a new way of thinking about imperfect fruits and vegetables. So they may have made some impact in the long term as well and allowed um, more of the food that's being produced to come into the retail chain and have people be enthusiastic and buy it. There's a lot of different elements to this, but they really were playing on making this weird looking stuff special and knowing that if they did something that was very eye catching and cute and clever, they would also benefit from the promotion. And they did. They made more profit during that week <clears throat> and they got tons of attention. And they even got journalists saying, we think all grocery stores in France should do this. So there's something really powerful about this example, I think. Now, don't know whether it would have lasting effects. It still needs to, you still need to make sure that all of those fruits and vegetables <clears throat> stay in the supply chain. But that's what they're aiming at. Um, and so it's a, it's a pretty it's a nice uh, example of what you can do with some good thinking and also sustainability. All right, so I want to show you two other examples. These are just websites. Um, <clears throat> that are maybe more accessible because they're in English. And this is one, again, sort of celebrating the weirdness of what they call, in this case, misfit vegetables, but saving money, reducing food waste, and enjoying the sort of cartoon superhero quality of these misfits. So we've got save money, misfit vegetables, talking about waste, there's a TED Talk, of course, because there's a TED Talk about everything. <clears throat> and then some examples. In these cases, not even such terrible looking misfits. Uh, so that was one effort. Now, in this case, it's in a relatively small area of the United States in this case, but it's the same kind of campaign. Another website, and so this is linked to from within the slides. Um, but another site is this one. This is also about ending food waste, somewhat less glamorous uh, website, but uh, the same kind of thing, showing funny looking fruits and vegetables, um, demonstrating how fun it can be to teach your kids about weird looking fruits and vegetables. Um, so there's some videos, some interactive elements and what you can do to take part, sign the petition, learn about Farm to Food Bank, go gleaning. So all of these things attached to the idea of ugly fruits and vegetables and just making it more normal, again, to buy fruits and vegetables that are not standardized. There is one more link in the slides that I'll show you. It's not actually a great video, so I don't have it queued up for you to look at, but this is um, come on. just another example, <clears throat> slightly different. So Isabella Suarez is a Portuguese woman who organized this, this campaign called Fruta Feia, which means effectively ugly fruits. And uh, again, she went around to producers and collected up all the imperfect fruits and vegetables and put them into 
boxes for consumers to buy. So she was basically doing a box scheme like a CSA, but in this case, selling them directly to consumers rather than going through the retail chain of a, as a supermarket. So it's the same concept, uh, different approach. Um, there is a video there if you want to watch it. It's about two minutes long, but I won't show it to you right now or you won't look at it right now. Um, but lots of possibilities here. And this is just really to get your idea, get your brains going about what can you do about changing some of the sort of normal but not very sustainable practices in our food systems. All right, going back into history a bit. Got another poll for you, uh, which I will pull up shortly, but this is about uh, farming. And it's really questions for you. What? Uh, uh, there it is, sorry. Um, so, question is, how many of you were raised on a farm? I'm just gonna ask you, were you raised on a farm? Here's the poll. Were you raised on a farm? And you could also say, you know, raised in a place with a very large garden. <clears throat> All right, so looking like almost everyone, one of you raised on a farm. Anyone else? All right, so overwhelming majority not raised on a farm. All right, those of you who haven't responded yet, wake up. And next question, Oops. how many of your grand, how many of your parents, grandparents raised on a farm? Let's see what the numbers are any different, if you know. Surprise, surprise. Yeah. So we go back in history, we see that way more people were either raised on a farm or had close contact with agriculture or food production in some way. Lots more. Um, and that's normal. That's exactly what has happened over the history of food production in around the world. There's been this migration from the country to the city, and there's been a reduction in the number of people who worked on farms. So uh, before industrialization, say 200 years ago and before, even probably 150 years ago and before, on average around the world, about 50% of human labor was dedicated to farming. So in a, in a family of four people, two of them would have worked in agriculture. 50% of the population, 50% of our labor worked in agricultural production before the industrialization of food. Does so anybody know about what that percentage is these days? Let's say in North America, what the average is for the number of people in terms of percentage who work in farming or agriculture? Any guesses? No guesses. Come on, someone guess. Maybe the video stopped. <laughs> less than 40%. It is correct that it is less than 40%. How much less? <laughs> Keep on going. Keep on going. A little bit less. Yeah, Pratik, 2% uh, North America. In fact, in the United States, it's like 1.2%. 1, 1 Canada's about 1.8, 1.9. The average around the world <clears throat> is now 2% of the population works in farming. So we've gone from 50% of the world's population or the world's labor in farming and agriculture. Now we're down to 2%. And that's because of industrialization, because of the mechanization Things like tractors and plows, uh, because of the use of petroleum to drive those tractors, and because of the use of chemical fertilizers. So we've gone in that same time, 150 years, we've gone from what, 2 billion people on the planet to 6, 7, 8 billion people on the planet. 
Um, so we were producing way more food with way fewer people or much less human labor. And so that's, that's a, due to all that industrialization. But it also means that all those people who used to work in agriculture are now working in all sorts of other areas, but very often in cities. Because as agricultural work in the countryside went away, replaced by tractors and chemicals and um, irrigation and all the things that make farming more efficient, there was less labor to pay people in the countryside. So there's this migration from the country to the city. And historically, whereas maybe 20% of the world's population lived in cities and 80% in the country, now we're over 50% living in cities, like urban centers like Toronto and Montreal. And that's just a huge shift and also changes all sorts of things to do with food transportation because now we're trucking all that food from the country or from other countries into our cities. So this displacement and migration and transportation is all part of the history of industrialization of food. Now the, you know, the good bit is that people are freed up to do other kinds of labor, but the bad bit is those people who wanted to continue working in agriculture can't anymore because of the concentration of farming and the cost of farming and the industrialization of farming makes it harder and harder to have a small scale family farm and have that be economically sustainable. It may be more sustainable in terms of the environment, but it's much harder to make a living that way. So these are some of the things that have shifted. And this is in fact represented in our own family histories who, where now we know we don't really grow up on farms that much anymore. Um, for the most part, and not just people who are living in cities and going to culinary school and you know teach, learning about food. It's actually all people are living outside. They're living in cities more often, and very few of us working in farming. Part of what's also problematic about that is that it's um, because we're disconnected from the land and from the practice of producing food. We forget that, like we saw in the last video, a lot of fruits and vegetables don't look perfect when they're being grown. And in order to take care of the land, you need to know the land and be on the land. And so the more of us living in cities and living far away from farming, living far away from the land, we're disconnected from the land, we're not being as careful about protecting it. And we're doing all these things that are more unsustainable with our food because we're not as close to the ways that it's produced. So this is what a lot of this work that we're all doing together is trying to reverse, is to bring people back into contact with sustainability, even if they're not working in agriculture. And so this is where we get back to this question of what's a food system? Um, so actually I wanna jump forward a bit and then I'll come back to that slide. <clears throat> so food systems, we talk a lot about food being parts of systems and systems of systems being how we understand the way that food is produced and distributed and consumed and all the things that happen. But to start understanding what a food system is, it's also worth backing up a little bit and understanding what food is versus agriculture. Agriculture being the process of producing the materials that turn into food. So agriculture is about producing plants and animals. Food is then the transformed tissue of plants and animals. It's the stuff that we eat. And therefore food systems involve more than just agriculture because it involves the transportation and the transformation, the processing, the retailing, the cooking, and the eating. Whereas agriculture is just the production on the land, food is the much bigger picture. It's the, what I've got on the slide, the entire web of processes that are involved in all these different steps, production, processing, distribution, consumption, and disposal. So food systems are very broad, very complicated, they interact with other systems, most importantly. Somewhere here. Nope, we'll come back to it. Anyway, they all interact with like marketing, like culture, like economics, and like policy and politics. So food systems are highly complex assemblages or combinations of many, many, many different things. And here's an illustration of those uh, combination, set of combinations. So in the bottom here, let me zoom in just a bit. In the bottom half of this image, you can see food systems are made up of 
what we're calling here activities and actors. So people and things that are done. And we've talked about them already, right? There's, there's um, pre-production, which is things like producing the inputs, producing the chemicals, and doing creating the infrastructure, um, and uh, producing the seeds. And there's actual production, which is the farming process. Post-production, which is transportation and processing, consumption is buying and eating, and waste and disposal. So that's the part that we know pretty well. That's one part of the food system. Another set of elements are what we call the drivers of food systems, the things that make us do what we do in food and that produce ultimately the outcomes of food systems. So there are lots of different drivers here, energy being one of them, the environmental elements, water and soil and air, the economy, things like power and equity, but policies come in here as well as research and development. And profit motive is part of what drives food systems as well as things like society and culture. Food culture is one of the reasons that we have food systems because we want to eat and we want to eat the things that are culturally appropriate to us. And then, of course, things like infrastructure as well, like roads that allow food to be moved around. So what does that do? That produces different outcomes. And the outcomes are the things that we're talking about in this course, one of them being the key outcome of sustainability or unsustainability. But then profit is an outcoming out. Profit is an outcome. Well-being is an outcome. Health, equity, we talked about sovereignty, security, all of these are the different things that come out of our food system. So we've got some inputs or elements that drive the food system. We've got the people who run the food systems, and then we've got the outputs. So it makes for a very complicated set of relationships and interactions. And that's, of course, why it's so hard to just make them more sustainable, because all of those elements, everything from the drivers to the actors, are producing the outcomes. And all of those are either supporting sustainability or undermining sustainability. So to create sustainability in a food system is not simple, obviously, um, partly because you have to act on each one of those different drivers, and then you have to act within each one of those different activities. Ugh, man, that's why we're in this class. Um, uh, yeah, okay, so I'll stop there. But um, so just again, a different version of what we were just looking at in that in that graphic image. Here's some inputs and outputs of a food system in terms of words. You know, obviously things like natural resources, soil, water, air, technology, chemical inputs, uh, me mechanized technology, tractors, petroleum, all that. Oh, petroleum also there in the energy area. So energy, petroleum, electricity other forms of energy input, human capital, human energy and effort, money, all these things go into the food system in order to produce largely this, us eating, right? So all of these elements come together into a food system to produce human nourishment. Now they also produce wealth and power for large corporate entities, but let's leave that out for now. Um, so those are some of the inputs, outputs, and the challenges, therefore, are all sort of right in there. So what happens inside the food system, and how might we adjust what's going on inside the food system so we can maybe, maybe reduce the technologies, reduce the cost, reduce the energy inputs, and actually still achieve all these things on the other side of the equation that we want to see happen. So let's uh, take a little break there. I'm going to come back and talk about the different scales of food systems because that's also one of the places where sustainability sometimes breaks apart. Uh, but let's take a 10-minute break or a 12-minute break and uh, regroup at, well, in 10 or 12 minutes. I'm going to turn my microphone and my camera off, but if you've got questions in the meantime, you can come and check with me and I'll text you back and I'll see each other in 12 minutes. Bye.
Okay, and we're back. <clears throat> Hello. <coughs> Choking on my water. <clears throat> That's a good sign. All right, so when last we spoke, not a chef, <laughs> we um, <clears throat> talk about food systems. And since it's such an abstract, no worries, um, it's such a it's such a sort of abstract thing to think about a food system. A food system, it's all these players, it's all these issues, it's all of these spaces, it's all these people. But one of the helpful ways to start thinking about food systems is through the idea of scale, large scale, small scale. <clears throat> so you can imagine a very, very small food system, which might be a self-sufficient farm. Family of four lives on a farm or has a really big garden, and they produce, process, and consume all their own food. So that would be a really small, self-contained, still interacting with some other systems, other environmental systems and maybe cultural systems, but maybe not attached to the big scale of food retail. At a larger level, though, you might have corporate farms or a much bigger scale of privately held farm that feed into commodity markets, commodities being things like wheat and rice and soy and oil seeds and dairy, the big food categories that are mostly produced by very large scale farming and then transformed into other products like, like grains and like oils. Um, and so they're also then connected to systems of trade. So that's a that's a bigger scale. And then at the at the biggest scale we've got, which is the planet, it's a, a very very large, complicated, interconnected system of supply, trade, distribution, and consumption chains. And most importantly, that also relate together different countries and also very large, sometimes transnational corporations. So that's the global scale. And at that scale, you can see how easily food systems are within and dependent on other systems. And those might be cultural systems or economic systems or ecological systems. But those systems are never really separate from food systems at any scale. Even at the very small scale, people are still interacting with cultural systems and environmental systems. Um, and so that's how things get more complicated. So the bigger the system of food becomes, the more complex, the more entangled we say sometimes are interconnected all of those different issues are. And that's why at the very large scale, sustainability is so hard to figure out. Whereas at a smaller scale, say a small family farm, it's easier or at least more obvious how to build in more sustainability. Now you could take this in the other direction, of, from small and go to the very small scale, which would be this kind of system. Right? And that's where the human body and it's the things it eats are also considered a food system in some way. I am a food system, you're a food system. And at that scale of things, it becomes much easier to understand how to build more sustainability. And we do things like we eat less meat, we use less plastic, we buy food that's more local, we buy food that is good for our culture and our identity and our health. So at that scale of things, sustainability is way easier to have uh, impact on because we're making very close in decisions that have very immediate effects. The larger you go, so from small to large, in terms of scale, the less evident or less immediate the impact are is of the choices that we make as individuals. The closer you get to a small scale food system, the easier it is, I don't know what that is, the easier it is to um, see the impact of your choices. So this is one of the reasons that scale is a very important part of understanding food systems. And we'll come back to this idea of the individual human being being a food system in some ways. So here's another, another layer to add on to all of that idea about food systems and how, how food systems have these drivers and these actors and then the outcomes. 
In this case, uh, we're looking at what we call a community food system. And a community food system has all the same elements as a larger or as a regular food system, let's say. But in this case, there are other elements that the community aspect, and this is very much about social sustainability, builds in to the food system. So things like engagement, that's about being a participant in your food system and not just a consumer of it. Um, it also has to do with questions like accessibility, making food more affordable and more available to people who have less means to either buy it or to go and buy it. So accessibility. Learning. Learning is a big part of it. It's not about being a blind consumer who just purchases what the store tells them to or what the marketing agent tells them to or what the media tells them to, but about learning, understanding, and understanding particularly how land and human beings produce food together. And then these questions that we've talked about already, things like sustainability and localness being an important aspect of a community food system. A community food system just bringing that big scale of things down to a slightly smaller scale, even if we're still buying food from large scale producers or participating in the global community, we're also understanding that close in and the people who are close to us are an important part of the sustainability of that food system. That's another layer. It is not a different kind of food system. It's just another sort of filter that you can use to view your food systems. So how did we get here? Well, in the very first class, we went through a very brief history of food systems. And I'm going to not even go in that much detail right now, <clears throat> but explain some of those steps or the major moments in the evolution of food systems. So we, we started out long ago as hunter-gatherers. We went out into the world to find the animals and the plants that we would then harvest or kill and bring back to wherever it was we lived. About 10,000 years ago, roughly, um, the dawn of agriculture, and by that we mean domesticated agriculture. So that was planting and raising plants in the places that we lived or close to where we lived, and also then raising animals close to where we live, rather than going out and following them like nomads or going out and harvesting them like fish whenever we, uh, whenever we got hungry. Um, from there, probably say 500 years ago, ish, we started doing things like seeing specific plants and animals for the traits or the qualities that they possessed that we liked, and then particularly breeding them or hybridizing them with other plants or animals to produce plants and animals, domesticated plants and animals that we liked the qualities of. So it might have to do with taste or size or speed to growth or productivity or anything. But that was when humans started kind of intervening in the natural systems of plant and animal life cycles to then control them a bit more and control them toward results that we thought were useful. Then we get into the more modern era when things get mechanized. We start adding, um, well, basically tractors and plows into the mix. Uh, that, that comes along with petroleum and, and gas-powered trucks and, and all the other system, all the other machinery that runs on different forms of energy. And that would have been, say, 150 years ago to, well, now. And then the major revolution that happened, uh, not in our lifetime, but just before our lifetime, was what we call the Green Revolution. And the Green Revolution, it sounds kind of nice, but it was actually really the beginning of the use of synthetic chemistry. Uh, so fertilizers, pesticides, all that stuff, as well as irrigation. And the Green Revolution was uh, post-World War II uh, technological change, let's call it, uh, starting around 1950, using all of those wartime, uh, not only wartime technologies like, like chemicals, but also wartime attitude about production, about increasing production, about being uh, very valuable for the economy, about making more and more and more and driving the economy. So the Green Revolution uh, was originally targeted at uh, countries like uh, Mexico and the Philippines, places where commodity crops, well, grain crops like corn in Mexico and rice in the Philippines were being grown. But the scientists who were driving this were very interested in increasing productivity through irrigation, through chemical inputs, um, for largely to, to feed more people. 
so there was a there's a positive intent there but then it produced a lot of the negative outcomes that we're seeing now in terms of pollutions and water usage um, and those are very sort of the negative effects of that revolution or that evolution in the use of technologies i'm going to skip over that slide but the main point is that every time we solve an issue with one of our technology, with one of our innovations, we produce a lot of effects. Some of them are positive and some of them are negative. And so with each evolution of the food systems, we are trying to not only solve for a problem that we've got, but also resolve the problems that we created just, um, just previously in the previous evolution. So most contemporary uh, examples are what I'm showing on this slide here. But I'm just going to walk through this because it's not entirely clear what this graphic is all about. So over here is the key, different types of change. So innovation in green, so like this one, this one, and this one, are different kinds of innovation that humans have brought about. And then there are also the effects that have happened because of those innovations. And those are the, the blue boxes here, here, here. So of innovation, we've got different kinds. We've got biochemical innovation, mechanical innovation, social innovation. An example of biochemical in innovation would be things like hybrid seed selection or the use of fertilizers or any of those chemicals. An example of mechanical innovation, things like using machinery, mechanization of any sort, transportation, irrigation. And then social innovation, things like changing policies, including creating land, land reforms so that different kinds of land could be used in different ways, but also things like bank loans or changing the distribution systems of food, logistics, those would be some of the social aspects, the innovations. And what happened? Well, there are a lot of effects. Some of them were positive, some of them were negative. Um, you know, in, by, by changing all of the inputs in terms of biochemistry, we increased yield, we controlled pests and weeds and all these other things that the chemicals are supposed to do. And of course, it also produced environmental degradation. It also produced one of the things that we forget about is that all those chemical inputs cost a lot more. So although we had higher productivity, we also had higher costs for the farmers, which may have, which clearly did have an effect on their, their profit margins. The mechanical change rate, the water supply where it was controlled, there was less labor needed, but that also meant that all those people who had been working on the land had to shift their labor to something else, including city work, some of which was very difficult conditions, equally exploitative, less connected to the land, less, uh, less uh, sense of human connection. Um, then in terms of the social changes, all sorts of things happen, including things like, oh, there are better seeds accessible. Uh, but there were also a there's a devalorization of labor that happened. There was land grabbing. There are a whole bunch of other issues that then come from these positive elements of social change um, that would end up being negative. So this is then we get left with is some positives, some negatives. And the next step, the next set of evolutions in our food system are trying to address those, those negatives. So if we looked at the previous iteration of the food system, what we're calling food system five, which is really just the evol fifth evolution of the food system. The issue there was trying to solve for quantity. The green revolution was all about developing innovations in chemistry, developing high yield crops, and controlling the water infrastructure. And this is what it did. Massively increased food quantity, massively increased damage to the environment. So positive effect, negative effect, right? Those are the things that happened because of the green revolution. So what do we do next? Well, this is where we are right now, and this is what we're trying to think through as food scholars and food students and food researchers and agriculture researchers particularly, how to address these issues of pollution, address the issues of labor, address the issues of energy usage, address the issues of water. And one of the responses that has been suggested so far and that you see sometimes is what's called a controlled environment of agricultural production. So controlled environments are just what they sound like, things like growing plants inside, in greenhouses or in grow rooms. And what we're seeing here in this image on the, on the right-hand side is a vertical hydroponic farming system where it's all, um, it's a system of, of irrigation that doesn't involve any kind of soil 
there might be some sort of substrate. Sometimes coconut fiber is used as a, as a, as a thing for the roots to hold on to, but sometimes it's just a bunch of roots dangling into a bath full of water, and that water has got all the nutrients pumped into it. So these are chemical nutrients that are beneficial nutrients going in. The roots are absorbing them and the plants are growing, but they're not sitting in soil. So that's called hydroponic or aquaculture. <clears throat> so lots of benefits to this. You can, through systems like this, of course, control, because you're inside, control the light and the humidity and the food and the acidity of the water, temperature. You can control for pests. You can have all sorts of systems that, that are very highly controlled, um, that produce a lot of food year round because they're inside. You can have a lot less waste and a lot less water usage. Even though this is all hydroponic, the water is being recycled and filtered. So it's a pretty good system. Less pesticides, less runoff, less damage to the environment. Seems pretty good. At the same time, there are some drawbacks. Major ones being that it's very expensive to set up these systems. And you can imagine that's a lot of infrastructure to build a greenhouse, to set up the irrigation system, to buy all the inputs, to set up the whole structure inside the greenhouse. All of this, very expensive. So it's not really feasible for a small scale farmer or a family to create. It's much more a corporate agricultural system. And then the second thing, particularly in cold climate countries where a lot of these systems exist, it's very energy intensive because that indoor space needs to be heated during the winter, it needs to be cooled during the summer, so there needs to be ventilation systems, a lot of electricity involved. And so that's also one of the issues that these systems of controlled agriculture, um, controlled environment agriculture have. Right now, 80%, as you see here, of Holland's agriculture is under CEA. And that's partly because it's a, it's a relatively cold country, so the, climbing, the growing season is shorter. It's relatively northern. It's also quite small in land mass. So in order to be more uh, agriculturally independent, the Dutch have made very intensive agricultural production in these kind of controlled environments. So there's some problems with this. You can also potentially, you know, if a virus gets in there or a pest of some sort that gets in there and it's, the conditions are favorable to the virus or the pest reproducing, you can have very quickly your whole crop get wiped out because it's still in a controlled environment and that can, those controls are allowing the negative things to happen. So those are some of the positives, some of the issues. One of the solutions that's being proposed, other solutions are things like genetically modified organisms. And because as we talked about last week, we're not really sure about the effects in the long term, either in the environment or in our bodies of producing and eating GMOs, you know, the, the, the jury is still out on whether that is a sustainable future. Clearly has some benefits, but it also has some challenges to it as well. So what do we do? And this is, this, is, this is the question that we're all facing. We don't really have an explicit answer. We do know we're going to be a very large population within about 30 years, 9.7 billion people is the current estimate. But we actually have to solve for sustainability right now because we actually can't keep going the way we are and we can't just rely on more technological solutions because we know that every technological solution also brings a lot of issues with it. So this is this big challenge and there aren't answers, but there's a lot of research going on. One of the things that uh, we've talked about a little bit and certainly in the story of stuff in that video that was part of the first class, we learned about the difference between a linear system and a circular system. And this is maybe one of the places that we need to start looking for the next evolution of the food systems. So linear system, as again, as you saw in that video, it's about extracting uh, from the environment and then dumping into the environment. So you're extracting resources, processing them, selling them, consuming them, and then trashing, well, trashing the planet, but trashing the waste. That doesn't work. We know that that's, that's a limited, got a limited lifetime. We can't keep going like that. We're producing too much damage to the environment and we're just ripping out too much of the world's resources to feed into that system. The circular food system or the closed loop food system tries to deal with this major this section right here of the loop, which is reusing, recycling, composting, and disposing less. That's what we saw in Annie Leonard's video 
as she closes the loop and tries to bring the end point of consumption back to the beginning point of production. Well, it's not so simple. So there's, there's the graphic again of the linear materials economy where you extract and then you trash. In the zero waste system, instead of extraction and trash happening, extraction and trashing, the key element here is recycling and composting and trying to make sure that recycled packaging and recycled resources of various sorts go back into the production chain. And that composting, which you know, you're not gonna take composted food and put it back into the production chain, but you put, take composted food, turn it into fertilizer, whatever that stuff is, like compost, and then the compost goes into the production system and feeds the farming cycle. So you're trying to do this. Now there will likely always be some more extraction that's going on. There will likely always be some landfill and incineration. The idea is if you can create increased attention in that, that zone of between consumption and production, maybe this whole loop gets a little bit more closed or a lot more closed and therefore becomes more sustainable. That's the idea that we're moving towards. And this is why at George Brown, you don't dump all the organic waste in with all the inorganic waste. You actually separate, and those two things get separated, hopefully, or going off to the city's composting facilities, and then that compost gets turned into a valuable farm input. It's tough, though. There's a lot of steps where it can all go wrong. So this is where all of us then have to get really engaged and involved with every part of the food system so we can understand how we have an effect on the road, those parts that we're not really touching directly. I'm going to come back to this video. <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to come back to this video actually for next class because it's kind of a, a great success story about a circular or closed loop system. Um, partly also, we don't have so much time today, and I want to uh, get on to a couple of other things. But Dan Barber, famous chef, really good at talking about uh, nice uh, stories from food systems. So we'll come back to that. And on to some definitions. Now I've talked about all of these. These are mostly here for your reference and for study purposes. We'll come back to them maybe next week. You can also just make sure that you flag this as a place to go and look for resources when you're doing your studying for the last for the exam day. Food, definition of food. I don't think we need too much definition of that, but we're thinking about nourishing human bodies. Food systems of delivering human nourishment. The closed loop system, which we just saw, thinking about circles or feeding back into production from the end point of consumption. Unintended consequences, those outputs that come from our food systems that we didn't mean to be created by technological solutions. The green revolution, again, which sounds really positive, but was actually really problematic, which started in the 1950s, and then we started actually knowing about more a couple of decades later after it had been documented. So this was the application of science to increasing agricultural productivity, and it was all those things like irrigation and chemical inputs. And then a few other ideas. Industrial food, most of you know sort of intuitively what that is, but the key points of industrial food are large-scale crops and monocultural production. Monoculture being the production of only one species in a given place. So that's like banana plantations or intensive uh, cattle ranches. Um, other issues are things like irrigation and chemical inputs. And then the food value chain, that's everyone who participates in the production and creation of value-added activities that go into making food, sustainability, same as above, but with maybe profit being less, or economic profit being less maximized, not disappears, just not the primary focus. And then this other one, human capital, which was in one of the slides. But this is skills and knowledge and experience. This is what human beings bring to the agricultural production system. It's not just application of technologies and science and expertise. It's actually the know-how of using the land that is part of what goes into uh, a food system as well. Now we're going to turn the page and start looking at ethics in the next slides, but are there any questions for the moment on food systems? <clears throat> questions or comments? 
Okay. So, onwards towards ethics. All right, so I'm going to you, have a video to share with you to start this off. Oh, oh great. Yeah, it's a really, it's a, it's a good, it's a good video. So we'll watch it maybe next week or you can watch it even just by yourselves, but we'll figure that out later. Dan Barber has got a couple of really nice videos on, on Ted. All right, so what am I doing? Poll. Multiple choice poll. And the question is, are you an ethical eater? Answer is yes, no, sometimes. And there's your poll. Answer now. Are you an ethical eater? Sorry, Chef. <laughs> Can you explain what is ethical eater? Ah, well, we will find out as the slides go on. So right now, the question, I guess the first question is, um, what is ethics? What does it mean to be ethical? It's a word that gets used a lot. Um, ethics uh, like, with value, which is what being, you being good, being bad, very loosely described. Um, if you don't know, then you can just say sometimes, which is probably the right answer. But um, but we'll we'll wait and see. So do your best to answer the question, and then I'll come and explain ethics in a second. All right. So some of you are not sure how to answer or falling asleep at the wheel. Um, some of you thinking yes, I am. Some of you thinking no. And a lot of you thinking sometimes. I think sometimes maybe the only answer that there really is because perfect ethics in this world is is pretty challenging to achieve because of the ways that our food systems are set up all right i'm going to pause this and i'm going to show you this video and we can come back to the the same questions or the same question again so for now i'm just going to write this down three undecided two yes two no seven sometimes okay so this is not my favorite video in the world, so I'm just going to prefigure it that way. But it does contain some, I think, useful points. It's about six and a half minutes long. Um, so I'll drop the link in chat, take a look, and just think about what these people are saying in terms of ethics and what they're calling eco eating. And we'll come back and maybe. You'll have another answer to whether or not you think of yourself as an ethical eater. So there's the video. I'm going to turn off my mic and camera, and I'll see you in six and a half minutes.
So hoping most of you have finished that video. Here's the poll again. Do your answers remain the same or do they change? Looking, looking maybe some people, oh, yeses have increased. Noes have decreased. Sometimes is have decreased. Some people have left the room. <laughs> All right. Uh, if you're still watching the video, you can stop watching the video and come and answer our poll question. Looking for six more answers from people. We're stuck. Something got stuck. All right, well, I'll leave the poll there for the time being um, while people decide if they're an ethical eater or not. Did anyone ch change their mind? And if so, why? Any answers from the silent room? I'll put it in chat. You can just reply in chat. Uh, okay, yeah. <clears throat> so, particularly, there was a, uh, an episode on Explained about uh, food. Is that the right? Ah, yes. Good, good answer. So, ethics <clears throat> sometimes it has to do with cost, sometimes it has to do with also being in a place where the system around you has made some ethical decisions. So uh, that guy who said, who ran the, the vegetarian grill uh, was saying uh, it, was really, it used to be really difficult to eat vegetarian or vegan food in restaurants. So 20 years ago, there weren't a lot of options on menus that were certainly that were vegan with no animal products in them at all. And that's very true. If the restaurant doesn't offer you a less meat option or a no meat option or a no animal option, you can't make that choice. You cannot be an ethical eater if the choice isn't presented to you. Same thing with grocery stores. Um, and, you know, even in farming, sometimes it's very hard to make the decision to be an ethical farmer and use fewer uh, chemical inputs or, or be a sustainable farmer and use all these different inputs because the system itself doesn't really support that or enable you to. So the, the whole question of, yes, sometimes an ethical eater maybe the, the, the best answer is because we can't be perfect in a system that is not perfect. Anyway, we'll come back to that in a bit, but there are a lot of challenges to just simply making better decisions because we exist in a world where those better options aren't necessarily available very easily. Um, so sometimes you have to go out of your way, sometimes it costs more, sometimes you have to find the places where you can make the better decision that isn't more expensive, because there's lots of ways to be ethical that are not about price. And that's the thing that we also need to remember. Sustainability doesn't always cost more. It just sometimes takes more work. So sometimes it's about time. So let's look at some of these definitions of ethics or explanations of what ethics is. And this, this gets back to that question. What is ethics in the first place? <clears throat> so these are just a few ways that you can understand the different meaning. Oh, great. Thanks for that. The future of meat on Netflix Explain series. Great reference. Thank you. So ethics, a system of moral principles that influence how we make decisions and lead our lives. Um, focus on what's considered good. And it's good not just according to us as individuals, but also to society as a whole. So sometimes what I consider good is different from what my society considers good. And so then you get into an ethical, sometimes an ethical dilemma. If you look to the etymology of ethics, it comes from this Greek word ethos, which means a custom, a habit, your character or disposition. So customs and habits are things that we do, and our character and disposition are things that we are. So ethos has to do with who we are, or ethics has to do with who we are, 
and then what we do. And those are maybe the very simple, you know, it's very simple, so sort of, maybe too simple understanding of what we, what ethics are all, all about. It's a guiding system. There's a set of principles, a set of moral principles, going back to that word moral again. It's also, ethics is also like a, it's an area of study, so it's an interdisciplinary area of study. Uh, but it's principles of conduct. So what we do, therefore what we, who we are. So moral was that word that came up a few times. And morals are related to right and wrong. Really, morals are what guides us, what gives us the guidelines to do things that are right and wrong in the world. And really, that's what we do and what we don't do. So the good things and the bad things. And that's a very, that's very simplistic. And obviously, good and bad are sometimes hard to differentiate. Good and bad are also sometimes based on context. Um, is it good or is it bad to lie? Well, it depends on the context, it depends on the person, depends on the lie. But morality gives us that personal compass, the way that we understand how to navigate, our, navigate through the world and determine what's right and what's wrong. So ethics also relates then to right and wrong, um, but at a more complex level. So ethics generally exists between human beings, how we treat each other, how we behave to each other in ways that are right and wrong, and then how societies behave to other societies. So, but it's about human beings for the most part. There's also this notion, this idea of land ethics. And that would be, again, taking this ethical framework and about thinking about how humans relate to the land. And now this is a relatively new concept. It's not until, oh, I guess about 100 years ago that people started paying a lot of attention to formalizing the appropriate behaviors of humans with regard to the land. Now this is in Western culture. In indigenous culture, ethics are kind of baked in because there isn't such a clear sense of separation between me and the land or between us and the land and then between us and the land and the food either. So ethics are also a Western philosophy. They come from a history of writing about these things from the Greeks onwards, but it's all very European in origin. And so ethics is also, I mean, there are, other, there are other standards of ethics and there are different kinds of ethics in different religions and different countries, but ethics as a formal system is very much a Western European philosophy. And it starts with this idea, as I said, that ethics originally were sort of about the relationships between me and you, between two individuals. Then we get into the idea of ethics possibly also existing between individuals and their societies. And so you get into ideas of like democratic decision-making and do unto others as you would have others do unto you. So those are, that's, that's there, you can't really read it very well, but the golden rule. So being good, moral towards our society and having society be good and moral back towards up, us. This is, that's the original understanding of ethics. And then, more recently, this idea of the land coming into this set of relationships, where it's about how I relate to the land, how the land relates to me, maybe, and how society as a whole relates to the land. So in, I believe this is in the 1950s, Aldo Leopold starts writing about land ethics. And his fairly simple, but also rich understanding of a land ethic is that it's enlarging the boundaries of the community. And whereas the community used to just be other people, with land ethics, we're talking about soil, water, plants, and animals, like everything. Like also the land being understood to also be the ocean and the air. So a land ethic is about having that same appropriate, moral, good relationship, uh, but extending it beyond just people to include the natural environment. Now, that was a great step. Land ethics, awesome. We are glad for Elder Leopold's work. But then if you're thinking about food, and as we understood before with food systems, the food systems includes more than just land. It's not just the agricultural production places, but it's everything in that whole wide, large food system. So food ethics 
gets into all these other things. So definitely land protection, but then animal welfare, the way we treat other living creatures, environmental sustainability, this whole course is about that, things like nutrition and well-being, diet, some of these are being also attached to religious and cultural practices. We talked about fair trade, there, there comes in another human system, but it's also about economics. Social inclusivity, so working through food to reduce the isolation that some people feel from society. And then things like hunger and poverty and, and justice, fairness, all these things that are attached to food, but then also become part of the land ethic and then also part of ethics in general. So that's where, again, we're layering on more qualifiers to ethics to make it more complex and then also more challenging to be ethical when it comes to making food decisions. We'll get into a couple of frameworks of religion and I'm going to show you some, some ethical standards around. But ethical is not ethics are not just out of philosophy. They do come out of religion and culture and tradition. So who we are as groups of people, whether we're practicing a religion or just practicing a societal norm, there are ethics built into that as well. Um, for a little, a little light break, we're going to take a look at a very short video, which I will share with you in the chat. It's about a minute and a half. So once again, I'll turn off my mic and my camera, but watch this video and uh, we will come back and see whether or not you think of yourself as an ethical Dorito eater. And here's the link. Surprise, it's not a promotional video for Doritos. Um, so there's, there's a quick little very, uh, well, sort of lighthearted, but also pretty dark uh, understanding of how our little choices in the world support, in this case, some incredibly unethical land treatment by, well, by Doritos owned by PepsiCo employing, or not employing, but using uh, very large quantities of palm oil. Palm oil, which is grown from palm kernels, which are from palm trees, which need incredibly intensive chemical inputs to grow. And so huge amounts of land in places that used to be rainforests are deforested, planted with palm oil trees, grown for the production of palm oil, which is an incredibly useful um, chemical, not chemical, sorry, an incredibly useful industrial fat very, very useful in all sorts of things to make them crispy, to give them good mouthfeel, and that is just perfectly awful for the environment. So there's this tension, right? There's, all right, the disaster of the rainforest is one thing. Eating a bag of Doritos is another thing. Is it unethical to eat one bag of Doritos? Meh, probably not. Is it unethical to make Doritos a part of your food life every day? Probably. Is it unethical of Pepsi Co. to make Doritos? Mm, sort of, maybe, maybe not. Is it unethical to raise palm oil? Mm, maybe, maybe not. But all combined, it creates these incredibly problematic, very unsustainable 
effects in the world. And this is where this sliding scale of ethics is such a difficult space to occupy. Really important to know about, really important to pay attention to. Um, and at the same time, there's no clear answer about what should I be doing? Well, I should probably just not eat Doritos anymore. But there's an awful lot of things I should probably not be doing uh, if I care about everything to do with sustainability and ethics. And I am a human being, and you are all human beings. And so we make these choices that are somewhat gray, but that we can live with within our own standards of ethics. Um, not simple, but like everything in food and sustainability, it's not simple. I'm going to skip over the study of ignorance, but there is uh, there's some interesting writing and, and text about how spreading ignorance or false information even um, is considered deeply unethical. Maybe one of our choices as food professionals is to spread good information and positive information. I'm going to jump over these uh, couple of slides as well. We come to this because we, you know, meat is raised very frequently as one of the things that we should cut out of our diets if we want to be sustainable and ethical. So we want to think about why and when we might address meat consumption. And to lots of people, particularly vegetarians and even more to vegans, they would say eating meat itself is fundamentally unethical. And so this is a question to ask yourself. I won't do the, the polling this time, but just think about it. For you, is that an ethical question? Is eating meat ethical or not? Is it unethical or not? And is it also, once again, sometimes the right answer? Or not the right answer, but your answer. So let's look at the next four slides and ask yourself, is eating meat ethical or unethical? Here's one, you can't really read the text, but basically, why do we love puppies? and eat pigs. Hmm. Here's a kind of joke probably from Facebook. Uh, if vegetarians love animals so much, why do they eat all their food? Well, all right, moving on. Here's another post from social media. Tell me again how we human beings are designed to eat meat. So there's the illustration of the human mouth and those teeth that look a lot like the teeth of this vegan animal versus this omnivorous animal and this carnivorous animal. And so the question is really, or the, the statement that's being made is, we are physiologically not designed to be meat eaters, so we shouldn't eat meat. All right, fine. This slide is playing with our emotions, right? It's saying, not really making an ethical question out of it, but making an emotional question out of it. Puppies are cute. Piglets, piglets are, well, they actually look pretty cute themselves. But why do we eat one, not the other? Well, partly because ethical systems have been built up around not eating dogs. Not everywhere, not in every society, because some, in some societies there are, there are dogs that are eaten. There are cats that are eaten. Um, there are all sorts of animals that are eaten. But pigs, hmm, well, a lot of a lot of societies eat pig. A lot of societies also don't. So this slide is also mostly about being an emotional play and not actually about the real questions that are at stake. This one is really just about sort of comedy and using uh, the irony of eating vegetables uh, as, as, a, as a critique of the argument that we shouldn't eat animals because we love them or we want to take care of them or we want to be ethical towards them. And then this one is the, is the physiological, the, the sort of science-based argument um, for humans not eating meat. But do any of these images actually influence your own ethical stance? Maybe this is a question. Have you been convinced by any of these images that you should not eat meat? Yes, no, anyone? Yes. All right, so some no's, a couple of yeses. I'll still eat meat. So for those of you who said yes, why did these images have an impact on you? What was it about them that seemed convincing or seemed like a good argument? Oh, yeah, okay. 
Oh well, yeah, and this is a question, right? We are we are we are physiologically omnivores. We can digest both plants and animals. Some animals can't, so they have different physiologies in us. Our teeth are not the only part of our physiology. But there is an argument to be said. You know, those are for plants than for animals. Um, but oh, voice! Has someone got their mic on? I guess so. <laughs> anyway, um, I was hearing my own voice coming out of the speakers. So studying a lot about vegetarian lifestyle and the images make sense to you. Yeah, well, they are they are good arguments in some ways, and then they are, yeah, and a good point that we don't have, yeah, sorry, so the, I'm, I'm jumping around too much, sorry. Um, the arguments can support our existing ethical stance. If I already think that eating meat is not so ethical, then some of these images and these arguments can be effective. If I am a dedicated meat eater, then using humor or my emotions or a physiological argument may not actually change my ethical position. But there are definitely, yeah, there are definitely a lot of reasons that um, our bodies are the way they are. And certainly we are not hunting with our mouths, as many carnivores have to do. Um, we are chewing up food, but we probably killed that food and cut it into small pieces and maybe even marinated it for a while to make it more chewable with our mouths. So again, that argument may not work if you have a stronger understanding of how meat comes into the human body. But if you believe that meat is not ethical, then this image might reinforce your existing beliefs. So on this, this is a, another slide that sort of makes the point that transitions to the question of eating insects. Uh, a lot of arguments right now are being made for using particularly small insects in the form of ground up meal or flour as a protein substitute. So instead of eating meat, we should be eating insects, we should be eating crickets. And then the, the joke here is if pesticides are, or not the joke actually, serious question. If pesticides are used to kill insects on plants, then can you be an ethical vegetarian if you don't eat organic? And there's another question for you, and that maybe is troubling if you've decided to be vegetarian in your life, but you're not eating exclusively organic food, then you are contributing to the death of a lot of animals, in this case, of insects. Um, and so that's another question to pose and see how it plays with your own ethics. So what does it ultimately mean when it comes to food work? Well, some of the questions that you can ask, and these may be, again, um, resources for you when you're creating your checklist assignment is um, maybe not about paying fair wages, but that's an ethical choice that you make as uh, as a restaurant owner, for example, or being loud and obnoxious, feeding your staff properly, uh, feeding your your clients with vegan options. These are some of the choices. But you could actually start thinking about this question when it comes to your food categories. One of your criteria could be, is my farmer working to reduce waste at the local level? If so, then that would add to the sustainability. You know, that might be one of the choices that you make for your checklist. And I'm going to move over these questions again because we're getting close to the end. And finally, end up with this question of, of meat and and is it better to eat a little bit of meat? Is it better to eat meat that you know exactly where it's coming from? Yeah, probably. Um, should we be driving research? in meat alternatives yeah probably things like clean meat which is meat that's grown not i mean we're not even really eating clean meat at this moment but meat that's grown in a in a in a laboratory rather than grown on an animal so this would be animal tissue that's not actually ever been attached to a an animal um, and right now that's being done in scientific laboratories to find out whether or not there's going to be a way to grow meat without having to kill an animal so this is some research that's being done. Maybe we should be supporting that. For the moment, it's not really commercialized, but it's been tasted, and mostly people say it doesn't have much much texture. They have the flavor, they have the nutritional quality, but it's not really pleasant to eat. And then there are all these things like Beyond Burgers and Beyond Meat and Impossible Burgers and things like this that are about using plant proteins to simulate the taste of meat and the texture of meat. And that may be a good solution. I think 
the real question here is, um, or the real answer maybe is, we need a mixed system. We need a hybrid system because humans will never give up on meat altogether unless something very dramatic happens. Um, maybe we're in the middle of that right now. But meat is a symbol of power. Meat is a symbol of luxury and privilege and wealth. And so to eat meat is not just about taste. It's also about this representation of the self. Represent, I'm representing myself as a wealthy, privileged person when I eat meat. It's one of the very important drivers of fast food being so successful is that inexpensive meat in the form of a, of a hamburger is incredibly successful because it gives it gives people with lower economic status the capacity to consume meat and feel the same sense of privilege and power that the wealthy elite who can afford finer quality meats. That's what they feel every day. So this is a, it's a very de difficult um, sort of ethics built into that. Because then there's also this question is, am I, as a relatively middle class person, allowed to tell someone else what they should and should not eat? And if you want to attain that sense of symbolic power that I have had all my life, is it ethical of me to say, no, you can't? I, I don't think I can. I don't think that's an ethical choice for me. All right. Alternative meats, can they be considered as processed foods? Well, that's a really good question. Um, if we're talking about plant protein burgers, they're definitely processed. Uh, they're processed in different ways, but if you're taking you know, peas or chickpeas, and turning that stuff into something that looks like and tastes like meat, you're definitely adding a lot of things to it, including some fats and some colorants. You're certainly texturizing it and processing it. So they're very definitely processed foods. Um, meat that's grown in a laboratory dish and then sliced into, I don't know, sandwich loaf, that maybe isn't so processed. But this is a really good question because, of course, the product's not on the market yet. So there's not been as much discussion about whether or not it's considered a processed food. But it's, you know, there's a very, it's a, it's a question that'll probably be coming up in the next 10 years. And India's just shared a link. Oh, great. Awesome. Thank you for that. We are always looking for good sources. Um, so for those of you doing your checklist assignment and that one of your categories is meat, coopersfarm.ca might be one of the resources that you look at. All right, moving on. Um, this slide is not very legible, but it is really about why eating uh, insects has a lot of sustainability built into it and why it may be a direction that we want to go in the future um, or even in the present. First of all, as they say, healthy, or you can, I can read it for you, healthy, sustainable, and delicious. Crickets are delicious if you find them delicious. 80% of the world and 80% of countries around the world eat some kind of insect. 2.5 billion people in the world are eating insects. So it's not like it's a really strange thing to do. That's about a, a third of the population. Um, more importantly, they're very high in protein, very low in fat. So they're really good for, this is the nutrition uh, element of this image. So crickets are really good nutritionally. They use very little water to produce uh, an equivalent amount of food. They use something like, uh, in this image anyway, one two thousandth of the amount of water to produce an equivalent amount of animal, edible animal protein. Uh, they have a very low feed conversion ratio. So cows, by comparison to crickets, eat 25 bags of feed, whereas crickets will eat two bags of feed to create the same amount of edible product. And they produce almost no greenhouse gases. So this is a really important aspect. They are highly sustainable in terms of the ways that they're raised. Now, are they delicious? Well, depends how you cook them. Depends how you season them, like anything. Um, so there are a couple of, a couple of examples here of some businesses. Next Millennium Farms, which produces, in this case, their value of cricket, pro, cricket flour as a source of protein, but of iron, of amino acids, and of calcium. There's a, an Ontario-based farm producing insects called Entomo Farms. There's the, there's the link if you want to take a look at it. They're calling it the most sustainable superfood in the world. Um, and had we been in class today, we would have done a tasting of their roasted crickets, which are delicious and quite enjoyable to snack on. But unfortunately, we are not together. So there's a couple examples of how crickets might be the next thing. 
Um, talked a little bit earlier about uh, the ethical uh, standards that are built into a lot of cultures and religions. And so this image here is mostly correct. There's something wrong in the Seventh-day Adventist column, which I have to correct. But for example, in Jewish culture, uh, there are a lot of ethical rules for the way we eat. Uh, that's all about kosherness. Same thing in, in Islam. So actually Judaism and, and Islam share a lot of the same attitudes about what is appropriate, what is kosher or halal. Um, those are very similar standards. So ethics, culture, religion all play together about diet. Now this slide again, you can't see on here, but you'll be able to see it on the PowerPoint that's on uh, Blackboard. This is a really nice set of um, myths, very useful to understand how uh, business businesses can be ethical and sustainable without being unprofitable. So this may also be a good resource for your uh, checklist assignment. And Pratik is saying, scientists are developing techniques where they're growing, building an artificial host body to grow any animal cells in a few weeks. Yeah, so this is this is what we're calling clean meat or tank meat, and it's very much in a research in the research phase. Although there has been some of this flesh produced and eaten by some human beings to see what it what it what it tastes like and what it feels like in the mouth. And for the time being, it's not super interesting, but that's the direction that that some science researchers are going with this idea of ethical meat. So just a few more questions. And again, these are, these are resources for you to use for your checklist assignment. Um, these are all sorts of questions that you might turn into the form of a criteria for, your, for that checklist. Um, some examples that maybe you want to think about are things like, were the animals raised? Outdoors, indoors, in the wild, on pasture, are they treated humanely? So ethics is part of sustainability, and you may want to think about including some ethical questions in your criteria. You can even think about were they grown from, were the vegetables grown from heirloom seeds, or were they grown from industrial seeds from a seed company like, say, Monsanto? Um, and then where is the food from? Was it from close, or was it from far? How much, how much travel is involved, how much movement? Other questions, more again, more related to, to ethics, or were the people treated well? Were they paid properly? Um, is the food certified in some way? Here's another question about transparency. Can I go visit the farm? So maybe one of your criteria would be, uh, is the farm or the producer of this food willing for me to come see how they make their food? Or are they trying to keep secrets? Do I want to be purchasing food from an organization to keep secrets? So those are other ways to interpret ethics towards your sustainable checklist. And that is it for the slides. These are all, as I said, available on, on uh, Blackboard. So go back there if you're looking for resources. But these are, I've highlighted as many as I thought might be useful for now. Last two things um, that we're going to do. One is the little mini exercise for today. And that is, I'm going to show you an image. Uh, share my screen. So for the end of the day, when we're going to not do this in class, but you can take about 10 minutes and do it at the end of class or do it sometime this afternoon. But before the end of the day, you need to send it to me. And this assignment is to create, let's see if I can find it, to create what I'm calling your personal food system. So remember when I talked about scales of food system, uh, we were thinking about how an individual human being could be understood as a very, very small scale food system. And so what I want you to do is think about uh, what's been going on lately in the past three weeks as we've been in isolation, as our food has, our food ways have changed to a certain extent. We're probably shopping a lot less or we're eating out, not at all. We're doing things differently because of this time of, of the pandemic. So this is a chance to reflect on what has changed in your food life over the last uh, over the last three weeks, basically. So just a few details. You need to uh, post this. No, sorry. You need to send me your assignment as a JPEG or a PDF by the end of the day. So anytime 
before midnight, basically. And it can be a photograph of a drawing that you make on paper, or it can be computer generated. So you can use a device or you can just hand draw it just as long as it's, it's readable and clear and send it to me at my email address. And what you're going to do is reflect on what I'm calling your personal food system right now and particularly how it's different since before all this stuff started happening with COVID-19. So some of the things, some of the things you can think about and then show in this drawing are the places that you are now getting food from and also the places that you're not getting food from anymore. So maybe other things that you are doing now, like I showed you my bread starter, I'm now like reinvigorating my yeast. Um, things I'm not doing anymore right now, I'm not going out to dinner. I'm not going having friends over for dinner parties. I'm certainly not going out for cocktail parties, but I am having cocktail parties on Zoom. So I'm meeting friends for a drink in the evening, but I'm doing it virtually. So that's different. What's changed? Are you buying groceries online? Are you being less wasteful? Are you being more self-indulgent? Are you eating more snacks? Are you eating fewer snacks? So just think about what has changed in your food life, in your personal food system over the last three weeks, and then draw what I would call a concept map. So it doesn't need to be artistic. Uh, it should help me understand what's going on. So you might want to include some labels and some connector lines, but basically you're showing me in a little drawing how things have changed since before and after COVID. So I've got an illustration. So I'm gonna post this set of instructions on Blackboard, so it will be there. I'm gonna stop showing that now. I'm gonna show you a couple of images of previous examples. So this is from a different class. This is not exactly what I've asked you to do, but you can sort of see this is not a very artistic drawing, but she's created some words and some connection points. Um, this person did a kind of Venn diagram. Again, this is not showing, this is not an illustration of this particular assignment, but this is what I mean by a concept map. Um, so these are just a couple of different ways of doing it. Doesn't need to be pretty, you just need to do it. Take, I'd really only take about 10 or 15 minutes to do it, but it's mostly about sort of showing through a kind of concept map how things have changed since before and after, and to reflect on whether or not maybe you're being more sustainable now in isolation, less sustainable, um, if some of your ethics have changed, if some of your behaviors or your choices are changing. And that's going to be <clears throat> just worth, it's worth 5%. It's one of the replacement exercises that we're doing instead of the pledge assignment. Um, and that's to end of day, email it to me. Any questions on that? Nothing. Okay, if you do have questions before the end of the day, um, just email me, um, just check in to make sure that you know what you're doing. Again, as I said, I will post those instructions on Blackboard as soon as the class is over, so you can go back and refer to them. And then the second thing is uh, for next week, so I'm gonna stop sharing that. So for next week, um, we are doing um, I'm going to show you some good news stories from the world of food. So these are a couple of examples about how people actually are making a difference and have found some sustainable solutions. And then the other part of the class will be exam review time. So with the final exam will be uh, on week seven in class time. Should take about an hour. Uh, it's going to be short answers and multiple choice. Uh, pretty straightforward. And to prepare you for that, we'll do some review in class next week. To make that as useful as possible for you, I'm going to ask you to bring some questions to class with you, uh, things that you would like to review and things that you would like to have more explanation about. So basically, I'm going to ask you to write down two or three questions for me to respond to in that class. And they should be things that you maybe didn't understand the first time or that you want some more clarity or you just want to have a little bit more exchange about. Have me explain it again, I will do that. And it could be a concept or a definition that you heard that you still don't feel like you really get. Maybe one of the examples or the illustrations that we had in some of the slides that again, just wasn't very clear. And you can either email me the questions in advance and then I'll have them ready for that class or we can just share them in chat and I will answer them that way.
You do have to do this uh, writing them down somehow uh, because it'll count as the third and final in-class exercise. So it's also worth 5%, just like this personal food system concept map. Any questions about that? All good? Okay, and again, I will post a reminder of that on Blackboard in the announcements, so you should receive that as an email as well at your George Brown address. And that is all I've got for today. Thanks for bearing with this online process once again. Um, if you need anything, I'm going to go, I'm going to close this room down and then go back into that other room that's available from the link in Blackboard Collaborate. If you got any questions or if you want to just post something in a non-public forum, come and find me there. Otherwise, stay well, stay sane. Uh, the questions, no, I only need them by uh, next class. Okay. Crickets, go to entomofarms.ca. Or just Google Entomo Farms, and you may be able to find where they're being sold. They're, they're kind of great. I'm really sorry we didn't get to the tasting because they're, they look like little tiny crickets and they taste like little pieces of heaven. Sorry, I couldn't resist. All right, take care, you guys. See you later.